We're now approaching the end of the Eden narrative. Among the events of the fall is the giving of Eve her name. For most of the story, she is simply referred to as the woman, or Isha. But once she assumes her new role and new identity in the narrative, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all life. This is appropriate as the word for living in Hebrew is Eve. Then, in verse 21, as God recognizes Adam and Eve are ashamed of their own bodies, he clothes them, as chapter 21 reads. God made leather garments for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Although they have just disobeyed his command, God accepts them as they are, in their new fallen state. We then read, God said man has now become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Good and evil appear throughout the story of Adam and Eve and the Hebrew terms for them are Tob and Ra. Tob for good, and Ra for evil. These two words are juxtaposed 79 times in the Old Testament, but they do not always translate as good and evil as we may understand it. At Tob and Ra's first appearance in Genesis, there are no ethical or theological overtones, so they can best be understood as meaning good and bad, or pleasant and unpleasant. In learning of Tob and Ra, Adam and Eve begin to become versed in the ways of civilization. They even now wear clothes. They become human beings of the world rather than that of paradise. And, in a psychological sense, they've matured into adults as children are characterized by an ignorance of Tob and Ra. One example of this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39, where Moses speaks to the Israelites with regards to the longed-after Holy Land, saying, the ones to enter the land will be the children whom you feared would be taken captive, and your little ones whom even now do not know good from bad, or Tobin Ra. Another example is found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15, where it says, He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. Tob and Ra are the words translated as right and wrong here, and the time before the boy learns to discern between the two is said to be how long at most before the Jews defeat their northern foes. The time span for this is generally thought to be about two or three years. For Adam and Eve, ignorance is a byproduct of innocence. This is why guilt is experienced after committing the reprehensible act of eating from the tree of knowledge. Much like children who have to get burned before realizing why their parent told them not to play with matches, Adam and Eve only truly understand why they should not disobey God after the deed is done, for a knowledge of Tob and Ra is a burdensome one. Then as the rest of the verse reads, now he must be prevented from putting forth his hand and also taking from the tree of life. He can eat it and live forever. The Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rad has an interesting view of this verse. In his book, Genesis, A Commentary, he writes, One would scarcely grasp the fine style of the author, which accommodates so many thoughts at once, if one missed completely in this statement the ironic, perhaps sympathetic, undertone. Even God's withholding of the tree of life is a precaution not without a certain double meaning. Certainly it is first of all punishment and a new sealing of man's destined death. Could man at all, after his sentencing, break through the ban of death? But we are not to ask such questions. Rather, we are to see that just the man, bowed so deeply by God's punishment, languishes unabatedly for immortality. And we are also to learn that the severe denial of eternal life also has a merciful reverse side, namely, the withholding of a good which for man would have been unbearable in his present condition. So God banished man from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove away the man and stationed a cherubim at the east of Eden, along with a revolving sword blade to guard the path of the Tree of Life. Cherubim are winged heavenly messengers that protect holy places and the presence of God. Like the processional gate to the Jewish temple, the way back to Eden is in the east, which is where God places the cherubim. Winged beasts such as these are common in much of the ancient Near Eastern world, appearing in art and mythology. The prophet Ezekiel in the 7th century BCE would later describe them as such. They had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. So here we have Adam and Eve expelled from paradise. 
With their eating of the fruit, Adam and Eve set into motion a calamitous loss of innocence, one unfavorable to God and to Adam and Eve alike. In their original state, they were entirely subject to God's command and had thrived under His divine providence. With the fall, they are now forced to live out of themselves as the guiding principle of their lives is no longer a steadfast obedience to God, but to their own autonomous knowing and willing. They no longer live in direct communion with their Creator, but they have indeed become like God in gaining knowledge of Tobin Ra. The ability to distinguish between good and evil, between good and bad, or right and wrong, is regarded as a divine characteristic, one that's acquired by a growing of age and is prominent among particularly righteous individuals. The much-revered King David is seen as being such an individual. He is praised in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 17, where we read, May the word of my Lord the King bring me rest, for the Lord the King is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. King Solomon is likewise portrayed as possessing this quality. In Kings 3.9, he asks God to give him a wisdom worthy of his father, King David, saying, Give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. Then, in verse 16, two women come to him with two sons, one living and one dead, and they both claim ownership of the living one. Solomon cleverly discovers who the true mother is by saying he will cut the child in two and give each woman a half, at which point the real mother says she would rather part with the child than have it die. He then gave her her son. Then, as it says in verse 28, when all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. In this instance, Solomon's discerning heart comes directly from God as he explicitly asks God for such divine wisdom and it is granted. But wisdom is not in the least a quality limited to the monarchy or the privileged. As Ecclesiastes 4.13 says, Better is a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who will no longer take advice. Though some individuals are specially appointed by God, wisdom is something to be obtained by all descendants of Adam and Eve. As all Jews have their origin in Eden, all have a knowledge of Tob and Ra, but to act out of a confusion of the two is to offend God and portray a false wisdom. In Isaiah 5.20, we find the inability or unwillingness to distinguish between good and evil associated with narcissism, hedonism, and corruption. As we read, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent.